testing. Hello, everyone. My name is David Spenny, and I'm a cadet in the Jayhawk Battalion at KU Army ROTC. Welcome to the Dole Institute of uh, Politics, and thank you for attending today's program. Presented by the, De the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time of the program you have difficult hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. If you stand and you are able to, just ask one brief question. Keep in mind the Dole's Institute mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around the importance and often difficult topics. Please phrase your question with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn your phones off. And now, join me in welcoming Director Audrey Coleman. Thank you, David. Wow, what a crowd. It's February, but I will say Happy New Year because this is the first installment of the 2024 Fort Leavenworth series. Welcome to you all. And I, it hasn't escaped your notice, of course, that this is a Wednesday and not the first Thursday of the month. We are so excited that you have come along uh, and moved and changed this routine that you've established for over 10 years, 10 plus years, to meet on the first Thursday of the month now we're on Wednesday and it's working because we still have some ROTC cadets in the audience and we're so excited to be able to engage more with our KU students as a result of that time change. So, so pleased about that. Uh, we have a wonderful series for you this year. Uh, thanks to David Cotter and Jonathan Abel and Mark Gurges uh, again for continuing this relationship with the Dole Institute. World Leaders in Wartime is the theme this year and George Marshall is an excellent way to kick that off. Uh, I want to extend congratulations on behalf of the Dole Institute to, to Dr. Cotter, who was recently named Dean of the Command General Staff College. So would you all join me in congratulating him? Before I turn it over to Dave, I want to mention a few quick program announcements coming up here at the Dole Institute. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we will have our friends from the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, presenting on uh, the state of U.S. fiscal policy, uh, of, of an issue of, of great importance and concern to us all. That's at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. If you want to come back, we'd love to see you again. Uh, next week, uh, we're getting ready to announce uh, a, actually an elections administration symposium. We'll have a public program on Thursday, February 15th at 7 p.m. We're gonna welcome Douglas County uh, Elections Clerk Jamie Hsu in conversation with uh, Kansas Secretary of State Scott Schwab and they're gonna talk about bolstering elections administration in 2024. And then lastly, mark your calendars for February 20th when our discussion group kicks off uh, with our, our 2024 Dole Fellow uh, County Commissioner, County Chairwoman, actually, uh, Karen Wiley, will be uh, convening a series of discussions on sustainability in Kansas, and that starts February 20, 20th. Wonderful to see you all. I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you so much for joining us, and please join me in welcoming Dr. David Cotter. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is the uh, sixth iteration of, of this series that I get to inaugurate, and I'm very proud to do so. Uh, this crowd is, uh, is very, uh, it's great to see this many people here. Um, and the, uh, the, I see uh, many familiar faces. I see a lot of my, my uh, colleagues from the Staff College here. Uh, but also we see a number of, uh, of uh, young people from the Reserve Officer Training Program uh, here at, at the University of Kansas, and we think that's really great too as we try to imbue uh, in, in, in the younger cadets uh, a sense and appreciation for history to inform their professional and judgment uh, in the same way that we try to do so at, at the Staff College. So um, welcome young folks, we're awful glad you're here. Um, it is my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Nance. Uh, doc, Dr. Nance has been a member of our faculty for uh, five years now, Bill? Six years, excuse me, time flies. Uh, Bill joined us uh, still as a serving active duty officer. Um, and uh, when he uh, 
uh, he opted to retire. His retirement was per, uh, approved, but his parole from the history department was not. Uh, and we were able, we were very fortunate to be able to keep Bill on uh, as a member of, of our faculty. He's an associate professor of history. He's a, he's a, a, a great general historian, but particularly expert uh, in World War II in the European theater. Uh, he's written two books that, that relate directly to that, Sabres Across the Reich, which talked to uh, cavalry operations during the Second World War. Uh, and his latest is, a, is, a, is the first really good work uh, on, uh, on General Simpson and the Ninth Army during the Second World War. Uh, and so he's probably uh, uniquely, sat, uh, uni uniquely qualified to talk and launch our program here and, and to talk about uh, General George C. Marshall, who was the Chief of Staff of the Army during that war. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bill Nance. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir, for that kind introduction. It's, been, it's great to be back here. The last time I was here, I was actually talking about the uh, General Simpson. Now I get to jump up a couple echelons. So what we're talking about today is a, a guy by the name of George C. Marshall, who shows up a lot, but we don't really spend a lot of time talking about him most of the time. You heard about the Marshall Plan. Uh, you've heard about all these different things. And he has been a general officer, somebody that's important to the United States military. And we don't even realize he's done it in many cases. Uh, for instance, he was so apolitical that he famously did not vote until he was a private citizen. Ch just did not do that. And uh, so uh, he, uh, just, he believed in doing his job and he believed in doing things properly and by the book. So uh, we're, we're going to kind of take through who he was and his service in World War I, World War II, uh, the uh, Korea, and the Cold War. We're going to focus on World War II because that's really where I think he probably had his largest influence. But before we talk about World War II, we kind of have to figure out who this guy was. So who is he? He is a graduate of that other military academy uh, that, uh, down in Virginia, Virginia Mil Military Institute. And uh, he was actually a Pennsylvania native, and some years later, when he was getting an arch dedicated to him, he joked that he was probably the only Yankee uh, that ever got an arch dedicated uh, to him at, a, at the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, and then when he graduated, he was not commissioned. And that's because in that day, officers came from either a direct commission or they came from the United States Military Academy. There were a couple other odds and ends, but VMI was not one of them. So he figured out, well, I'd really like to be an officer in the United States Army. And the Army's like, well, there were a series of uh, reforms getting passed through, uh, some of which uh, is going to directly affect the, uh, the cadets here. Uh, as we figure out exactly what that officer commissioning system is going to look like, that's going to culminate in 1916 when we commit, uh, commit the National Defense Act of 1916, which is going to create the Reserve Officer Training Corps. But before that, they'd said, hey, the Army was like, oh, we're going to open this up to non-West Pointers. So we had to pass an exam just in order to be commissioned in the United States Army. Up until that point, he's like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. So he uh, got a job as a teacher and then got uh, told that he had been, that he had been uh, uh, accepted to be commissioned in the United States Army. So he's like, I guess I'm not going to be a teacher anymore. So probably good news for the, for the United States uh, in the long run, right? So at that point, he commissioned the infantry. I don't know what it is about me and talking about uh, infantry officers. I'm an armor officer by trade. But, uh, but he was actually a little confused because he thought he, wanted to, he was going to go into the artillery. That's what he'd asked for. And that's what he'd hoped to get. And in the grand old army tradition, they said, that's great, that's wonderful. We appreciate your, uh, your interest in national defense. Uh, here's a commission in the infantry. And he was like, okay, uh, I'll, I'll do what I can. So he got married to his first wife, uh, Lily, right before he was uh, sent to the Philippines. He did not bring his wife with him because she was of ill health. And also the Philippines at that point were exceptionally, the term is austere. Uh, the Philippines, uh, we were just in the, uh, had just finished the, Phil, uh, the, the worst part of the Philippine insurrection during that time frame. And he arrives in the Philippines as a young second lieutenant of infantry and gets to participate in the post-insurrection duties uh, that happened during that time frame. He does well. He's eventually promoted up to uh, company commander, still a second lieutenant, mind you, but he's promoted to company commander. Uh, and he leads his company through the Philippines. He ends up uh, as a uh, prison, as a uh, commander of a garrison uh, protecting a uh, United States Army prison. 
he doesn't really like it very much. One, it's kind of dirty and nasty, and two, it's not really duty that he is uh, naturally accustomed to, but he does it well. So he goes, comes back, and then comes to Oklahoma at Fort Reno. Is anybody familiar with Fort Reno? Because it doesn't exist anymore. The reason for that is there were approximately six companies of, uh, of, the, of the Army present there, and it's one of the small little postage stamp forts that existed in the United States military all over the country in the early 1900s and into the 19-teens. These will eventually fade into obscurity, and we're lucky that Marshall didn't because he spends the next several years kind of bouncing around to all these different little posts, just kind of doing his job, doing garrison soldier kind of things. And at that point, he kind of builds up a reputation for being a good soldier. He does his job. He doesn't complain too much. He, and he succeeds kind of wherever you put him. Kind of a nice guy to have, right? Okay, so... Uh, he comes to Fort Leavenworth, uh, and at the time it's called School for the uh, Cavalry and Infantry. He, is accept uh, he uh, gets accepted. He comes through at what we would call the Command General Staff College. It's not called that at that point, but he goes through it. He does really, really well because the second year of training is the highly competitive year. The first year is for most any officers. Bear in mind at this point he is a first lieutenant. First lieutenant, about four years in the Army, and he's going through this school. He then, is, but he says, I want to do more. I want to get better at what I'm doing. So what he does is that he uh, applies himself really, really well. In fact, I believe our number one, our award for the number one uh, graduate is the Marshall Award. Uh, so he goes and gets selected. It's a highly competitive choice for, his, for, the, uh, for a second year at the, at the staff school. And at that point, he is doing more map exercises, more staff exercises, and he does really, really well. So well, in fact, that the faculty turn around and say, this is the guy, with about two or three others, that we want to remain on the faculty after he graduates. So imagine, you know, you, uh, you guys get commissioned, and the next thing you know, you, your PMS says, hey, you're going to go be uh, on the faculty here. And that's what he does. Uh, now, he has to get a waiver for that because the Students are supposed to be captains, and he is a first lieutenant. And yet, he is so good at what he does that the, uh, that the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, faculty say, no, this is the guy we want doing all of this. So he kicks around doing this uh, for any number of years, and then he also gets to work with the Pennsylvania National Guard for quite some time, and he gets to start to learn what the National Guard is like. Bearing in mind that the National Guard at this point is not even really the National Guard, they are a series of state militias. The National Guard, of course, coming around as a formal status, also with the National Defense Act of 1916. So he m helps mobilize the U.S. 1st Division. And notice that I'm not, I didn't say the 1st Infantry Division, but it's the 1st Division. It won't get the designation of the 1st Infantry until uh, it uh, uh, goes in into its triangular formation around 1939, 1940. I forget exactly when the 1st ID swapped over. But they're the first U.S. division that are put together, and they are uh, assembled from an agglomeration of four different regiments and sent to France. Their uh, commander is a guy by the name of Major General Siebert, who is an artilleryman. Now, Pershing gets over there as to command of the uh, American Expeditionary Force, and he doesn't like the fact that an artilleryman is leading four regiments of the United States Infantry. So Pershing is coming up with reasons to kind of pick at Siebert. And at this point, Marshall is the acting chief of staff of the division. Why an acting chief of staff? Because that's the, uh, he is one of the most experienced people. He's been through the staff school. He's, uh, you know, he's, had, he's had some schooling, and that's his job to do. He finally gets, they finally get a real chief of staff of their appropriate rank in, and Marshall hands off the job. Well, right about this point, there's this, uh, kind of a big blow up where Pershing comes down to uh, watch an exercise that the 1st Infantry Division is going through as they're training for combat. And it's a new exercise. The division commander has not seen uh, this unit do the, this particular uh, battle drill before. And Pershing starts nitpicking him on all the small little details, never mind that it's the first time the division commander's seen this particular exercise run. Pershing then, in fine form, 
turns on the, chief, the new chief of staff, the guy who just got there, and starts tearing into that guy. And he, what do you mean you don't know this? Never mind that Marshall's been handling all those duties and they're still on their handoff phase. And at that point, Pershing says, you know what, fine, and starts to leave. Pershing, excuse me, Marshall, says, excuse me, General. Well, bear in mind, this is at this point a young captain telling the senior general in country, excuse me, sir. Well, Pershing doesn't pay much attention and continues to walk off. At that point, Marshall comes up, grabs him by the shoulder, and says, excuse me, sir, you need to listen to this. <laughs> so for those of us uh, that have uh, been around the military for more than a minute, you realize that he has either committed career suicide in spectacular fashion, or he has catapulted himself. <laughs> and he actually did the second. Pershing turned around, and uh, Pershing turns around, and Marshall, to this, uh, when he's writing his memoirs later, says, "I cannot recall what I said." It's like I, you know that moment where I, I, I blacked out. <laughs> I know I said something, <laughs> but I guess it was good. So Pershing listens to him and goes, "Oh, I understand what you're saying," and then goes off. Now Pershing is still not a big fan of the division commander, but at this point in the game. Every time Pershing wants, uh, visits the 1st Infantry Division, he seeks out Marshall. He says, hey, Marshall, what do you think about this? Hey, Marshall, what do you think about that? Because one of the problems that general officers have, and it gets, uh, it gets worse the more senior you get, is, is that uh, you get enough rank on you and people say, yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. <laughs> yes, sir, that's a wonderful idea. Yes, sir, I, I agree 100%. Yeah, and Marshall's not that guy. Marshall tell him, will tell Pershing what he thinks. And Pershing really likes that. To the point where, uh, as they're getting ready to go into combat, Pershing says, you know what, Marshall? I need you up on my staff. I don't need you in the 1st Infantry Div or in the 1st Division. I need you up here with me because I need a staff officer whom I can trust, somebody who can do the job, do it effectively, and somebody who will tell me when I'm being an idiot. That's a very, very valuable asset to a, to a leader and I will give Pershing the full credit for realizing and, and accepting the fact that someone told, could tell him no, and not only did he listen, but he encouraged and grew that individual. Think of the example Pershing set by listening to that young captain as he goes forward there. Uh, uh, he, uh, he helps plan the shift from the, from the, the Sam Hill, from San, from the Sam Hill Offensive out to the Musargon Offensive. That is the minor task of moving an entire field army's worth of combat power 180 degrees off of its original axis of advance to a new axis of advance. Just small little details of a couple hundred thousand soldiers, so, you know, a couple million pieces worth of equipment. Uh, just, just moving all of that and doing it in a couple weeks and launching the offensive on time. We can have our opinions about how the Muse are gone offensive, but the very fact that the American army did that is a testament to Marshall's planning ability. Okay, he's a temporary colonel by this point. Particularly in World War I and World War II, we had what were called temporary ranks. Uh, they went by various and sundry names. This one was the Army of the, uh, army of the United States, I believe. And the idea being is, is that when we would expand our military, um, well, we need a bunch of senior rank folks. So, but we were, the idea is we're going to contract the military after the war. We don't need those senior ranks after the war. So you get a temporary rank. And at this point, Marshall gets, goes from captain to colonel. Good work when you can get it. Uh, now, after the war, he's going to revert back to captain again, but for now, he's a colonel. So after the war, he kicks around doing any number of different things. Again, Marshall is not what you call, a he's not known for his combat exploits. He is not known for being a George Patton who uh, is in command of the 1st Tank Brigade, gets his tank mired and uh, goes forward on foot and, uh, and gets uh, wounded uh, by shrapnel. He's not that guy. He's not Douglas MacArthur leading the, fir uh, leading the 42nd Infantry Division from the front. That's not him. He's an organizer, he's a thinker, he puts things together, he does it well. Does that mean he's bad at being a frontline infantryman? No, it's just his current, jo his jobs require him to be moving, uh, moving the systems and making the processes work. 
Okay, so he moves on and does, uh, he gets picked to be the executive officer for the 15th Infantry Regiment in China, a place called Tianjin. Uh, that is actually where you pick and send a lot of our uh, up-and-comers. Why? Because that regiment is off by itself. This is in the day and age before we're able to effectively and easily communicate over large distances. And Marshall has to basically operate on his own. He learns Mandarin, which is going to stand him in good stead later when he has to deal with the Nationalist Chinese, Chiang Kai-shek, and any number of other uh, Chinese officers. He also spends some time learning the culture, learning the people around it. Comes back from China, and then his wife dies. Uh, she had actually been uh, ill for many, many years, and uh, she had died. At that point, three years later, he will remarry, and as a testament to his relationship with Pershing, he has the senior American officer in the entire United States Army as his best man. So imagine that at the wedding, you know, where you've got all these uh, captains and lieutenant colonels and majors, uh, you know, showing up in the uh, bridal in the in the wedding party, and there's you know the big man himself, uh, Pershing, the hero of the First World War. <laughs> Obviously embarked for uh, for greater things, serves with a uh, and again, nothing big, nothing big and fancy. It's all staff positions. Uh, he does uh, he has some leadership positions, chief of staff to the 33rd Division. Uh, U.S. Army National Guard during that time frame. I believe the 33rd is Illinois National Guard, uh, Upper Midwest National Guard. Why a regular Army officer as a chief of staff of a National Guard division? We're still figuring this whole National Guard thing out. And we don't know exactly how to train them, how to equip them, and also what kind of officers you'd get there because the Guard at this point is very heavily state politicized. And the idea being is, is we're going to put a couple regular Army officers with them. Today we would call them AGR, which stands for Active Guard Reserve. And the, the idea is he's a full-time officer who can help that division kind of work through its planning processes. Again, he's good at what he does. He's a good staff officer. It's like, hey, let's go, go help out the, the National Guard as they're forming, uh, as they're forming these uh, units. And then, again, kicks around a little bit more. Uh, and then he, he ends up at the infantry school at Fort Benning. And everyone's like, okay, what's the infantry school? Today, it, is a, it, would, it would be basically a agglomeration of what we would call the officer basic course, the captain's career course, and a little bit of the command general staff college all kind of thrown together. It's basically the infantry branch's professional military education for infantry branch. And Marshall gets there, and he looks at a lot of the staff processes, and he goes, guys, we need to fix this. It's overly complex. It's overly bureaucratic. And all the exercises are stilted. It's all working off the same maps. It's the same area. You, everyone knows the drill, right? It's like, OK, we're going to go to this. We're going to go to this Ford, and we're going to do this. And it's all very, very scripted. He said, guys, combat's not like that. When I served in France, I didn't necessarily have maps marked in English. Shocking, right? So what he does is that he says, we're going to do map exercises, but first off, you're not going to be given a map. We're going to go out to a random piece of terrain. We're going to look at the officers and say, come up with your course of action. Well, sir, where's my map? You don't have one. There's no mapping for, the, for this area. Figure it out. The idea being is, is uh, according to Marshall, is he's like, a young officer or an, any officer should be able to look at the ground, look at their forces available, understand the enemy situation, and make a course of action and do it rapidly. Well, what if I don't have this? I don't care. Figure it out. Or, hey, I'll give you a map, but it's in French. Or, I'll give you a map, but it's 15 years out of date. Because, again, you're going to have to do this. I will tell you from personal experience, rolling into Iraq, we had maps that were not always the most accurate in the world uh, when it came to cultural data, all the buildings and bridges and all that kind of stuff. You literally had to figure it out. Uh, my wife, who's an engineer officer at the time, her best friend was a platoon leader with her, and there's a tank rolls up to her and says, hey, can I cross over this bridge with my tank? Jackie kind of looked at it and goes, try and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because that's where we were. And if we think that this is a problem, uh, and the point, uh, and the reason I bring that up is, is that 
This is not a problem of the 1920s only and the 1930s only. This is a problem we're dealing with today. We're very spoiled with GPS and uh, being able to pull up your map on your phone or on a JCR, uh, all these kind of things, but you don't necessarily have that ability sometimes, or sometimes it breaks. So Marshall is pushing these guys forward. He's also pushing for simplicity. He's like, guys, if it takes you a really long time to create an order, and it's got, uh, you know, and it takes you forever, and it's, and it's a stack of paper like this, Soldiers aren't going to read, one, they're not going to read it, and two, if, even if they do read it, it's going to be really hard for them to carry out. So he's stressing simplicity. He also understands that the United States Army is generally going to be comprised of a series of amateurs. We're an expansible army. This will only change after really, you, you could argue, 1945 or perhaps even a little bit later. But the idea is, is that we're going to have a small regular army where then we will get a huge number of civilian draftees or volunteers and they will come into uniform and if you are a captain you'll get to be a lieutenant colonel or a major and on and on and on and we're going to be giving our second lieutenants these maps and these orders and their uh, their experience level is not going to be very high so We've got to be able to keep it simple, keep it short. Also, what he discovers is, is that if you make it complex, it rarely works in warfare anyways. Okay, finally, and this is the thing that gets him into World War II. 1938, he's serving the War Plans di uh, Division, and FDR is trying to figure out how to support his Western allies. And he's, uh, and uh, FDR has been really impressed with a lot of the air power, uh, the potentials of air power. And he's saying, you know what we really need? We really need a really big air force. And we really don't need a big army, just a big air force. And they're going around the room and everyone's doing the yes sir, yes sir. Makes sense, yes sir, I like that. And he goes to uh, Marshall and he says, George, what do you think? And Marshall doesn't like to be called George. Not, in, not, by, uh, not by anybody uh, other than family and friends. It's General Marshall or Colonel Marshall or whatever it happens to be, but he is a very formal individual. So one, that kind of upset him a little bit. And then two, he sits there and goes, no, sir, I disagree completely. I'm sorry, Mr. President, but, that's, but I disagree. And everyone kind of goes. <laughs> because again, this is now the second time he has taken a stand against a very, very powerful individual, somebody who has the authority to basically end him uh, professionally, and he takes a diametrically opposed position. He's a little bit more polite about it to FDR than he was to, uh, to Pershing. He probably matured a little bit since then. And at that point, FDR kind of goes, huh, you I like. So the, when they came up uh, for the next chief of staff of the United States Army, who's Roosevelt going to tell the army that he wants? The people that tell him what he wants to hear? Or the guy that tells him his honest opinion? Maybe not the truth. We don't know. Sometimes there is no truth. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just your professional opinion. But he asks for Marshall. All right, so let's get into World War II a little bit. Anybody notice the significance of that date there? 1 September 39? The invasion of Poland. So his first day on the job, he now has a global war to contend with. Welcome. So uh, at that point, we're going to enter the uh, pr uh, protective mobilization plan where we start activating our National Guard and reserves, getting us ready for war even before war kicks off. And Marshall's the one in charge of this. Now what he does is he does this actually very, he, he plans this very smartly where he realizes that our guard and reserve are not nearly to the stage they need to be. So when he plans, uh, he plans a series of maneuvers right before the guards and reserves time on active duty is set to expire. And they are, as you might expect, the very first time the United States Army has conducted core and army level operations. Um, they don't go so well. <laughs> And Marshall then turns to the president and says, hey, Mr. President, I think we need to keep the Guard and Reserve on active duty a little bit longer. FDR goes, okay. And again, just look at the numbers, 189,000 to over 8 million. I'm not a math uh, teacher, but I think that that's a, several orders of magnitude in growth. So he is having to deal with this. Now, so what are his decisions? Is he worried about every training soldier? No. 
But what he has to do is he has to look at all these generals and figure out who gets what. So who's going to command an army? Who's going to command a corps? Who's going to command a division? Who's getting left by the wayside? That's his the, those are his decisions. Now, does he have a staff helping him? Of course he does. But Marshall is the one sitting there having to sift through all of this. Now, there's been much made about his famous black book that he had when he was at the infantry school uh, where he was marking down the names of, uh, of up-and-coming officers. To our knowledge, no such book actually exists. However, what we do know is, is that he probably kept a mental list, uh, and you're known by your professional reputation. So if you do good in a professional military education school and, the, uh, and your faculty then go off to other things, guess what? You go off and do other things too. And so Marshall had that, uh, had that list of people who had good professional reputations and he had a list of uh, people that he had worked with in the past and he starts with the people that he knows and trusts. Sort of makes sense, right? I know that I can trust you to do a good job so you're gonna get first crack at this. Who do we know is gonna be good at leading a field army in combat? We don't know. The last time that happened was 1918. None of the people that uh, were leading a field army in 1918 are physically capable of doing such. Pershing is still alive, although not very capable. And uh, again, Marshall, who is a young, well, then colonel, but a young officer at the time frame, is now the army chief of staff. So he is the one handling all these internal politics. He has the other problem, too, of we have to mobilize the National Guard. Now, the National Guard has this added problem of many of the officers were chosen for their political connections within the state. What that means is that that's not necessarily the best officer to command the division in combat. The other problem is, is that some of these guys are significantly older than what they want to uh, serve in combat. Uh, Marshall says that uh, combat is a young man's game. He does not need a bunch of 65, 70-year-olds leading young 20-year-olds in combat. Not the best uh, action in the world. You can do great things, but I need you to stay in the States. I don't need you to be so uh, incapacitated by health that I can't use you. So at that stage in the game, he starts having to sort through this. This makes uh, a lot of political enemies with the National Guard something like 16 National Guard divisions, and he relieves 15 division commanders. That is not, uh, if you're looking to win friends and influence people, that is not necessarily the way to do it. However, he, what he does do is he does manage the personalities. He is getting phone calls from senators on a routine basis. One of the uh, generals he relieves is a guy, by the name of Major General Truman, of the 35th Infantry Division, cousin of that Truman. Uh, who at that time is the head of the Senate Armed Services Committee, who is cutting the checks for Marshall's army. So he has to deal with that one. So what he does is he finds people with, a reputation, with good reputations with the National Guard that had worked with the Guard in World War I, and he brings them on board. Uh, one uh, shout out to you know, a previous talk that I'd done, that's Je uh, General Simpson. Uh, who is brought on board as, hey, you've got a good reputation with the National Guard, why don't you come on and take this division? So he's, he's fighting through these issues. He's also absolutely brutal in enforcing the chain of command. He refuses to let anybody get in the way of the chain of command. So when he's sending an active duty officer who may have just pinned on Lieutenant Colonel to go be a division chief of staff, he says, you're now a full colonel. But sir, I just put on lieutenant colonel. I don't care, you're a colonel now. Here's why. The other primary staff officers are lieutenant colonels. They've been in the guard for a long time, meaning they've stayed at that rank for an extended period of time. If you show up as just another lieutenant colonel, even though you have the position, you may not have enough wasta or weight to, pull, uh, to make them listen to you. But if you show up wearing a rank higher than them, you will. So he pushes that forward as he goes along. And the, this continues. So he's fighting internal army internal politics. He's also fighting the Army Air Corps, who wants a lot of good folks. Those belong to him, but they're still fighting him because they're their Air Force, and they do that. He also is fighting the Navy Department in terms of resources and manpower. 
Because as we stand up the draft, as we stand up, uh, as we start inducting all these new people, we're basically giving them tests to see where, where their aptitude is. And the idea being is, is you put high quality folks or uh, very smart folks in positions that need that. At least that w that's the way it works in theory. The idea being is you don't want to put the guy that uh, you know, can mostly tie his shoes up in an airplane. That leads to bad things. Uh, same thing, you don't want to necessarily put him on a ship. Also bad things. So where does that guy generally end up? He generally ends up in the infantry, to be honest. But, uh, but the idea being is, is that if you put all those guys in the infantry and in the combat arms, you have a very low quality army. So he's fighting for resources. He's also fighting Congress because every time he turns around, what do you think some young drafty uh, who doesn't like what is happening in his lot of his life is doing? Fighting his congressman. So he's getting, he's getting calls about that. He's getting arguments about that. At one point, he realizes, oh, we have to actually stop inducting people because we've run out of places to house them. And you're like, oh, soldiers, they can sleep on the ground. Well, that works right up until, you run, until somebody writes their congressman. So he has to go back to Congress and ask for more money. Now, a quick funny aside on there is his second wife has been doing some renovations on their house, and she apparently blew past the budget a little bit. So she had been uh, listening to his testimony in D.C., telling Congress, hey, look, sometimes budget, uh, we, we, we plan and we budget, and we do the best we can, but sometimes stuff happens. He walks back into the house and says, hey, honey, um, you know that testimony you just gave? Just remember that uh, as I tell you what happened with this home renovation. And he kind of kind of goes, okay, okay. There aren't going to be any, any any investigations on this one, though. So, as so he's building up this army. Now he tries to stay out of the geopolitical and national political decisions as much as he can. He tells uh, the president, "Hey, look, this is what we can do. This is what we what I think we ought to do." But honestly, anything that uh, is politics, he's going to try and stay out of to the best of his abilities. Now, let's look at here. So we enter the war. Now, at that point, now not only is he having to correspond with congressmen and senators and governors, and so he's hurting those cats. He's hurting all the army generals that all want a piece of the pie, and now they're all going off and fighting. So he's corresponding regularly with Stilwell out in China, Eisenhower in the Mediterranean, then up in England. He's corresponding with, and he's also corresponding with Admiral Leahy, uh, Admiral King, all of these guys. He now has to deal with his allies, and they're going to be a nice, friendly, helpful lot. But no, everyone's doing their own thing. The U.S. comes and says, we want to launch an invasion of the French mainland. And the British say, no. Like, well, I thought we were uh, in this together. And the Brits go, yeah, but you don't have an army yet, and we don't have the ability to do that. So we're going to have you guys go to North Africa instead. And he has to fight through that. He is stuck in the, uh, he, and then once he gets his people over there, he now has to deal with the fact that Eisenhower, the man that he put in charge, is now having to deal with the British chain of command. And he has to provide top cover for them. And uh, one of the, his big problems is that Churchill and FDR are really good friends. And the one thing that you want to be very careful of as a staff officer is letting your boss sit, uh, sit with someone else who likes changing the plan. And Churchill loves changing the plan. Churchill views any time that he's outvoted as basically a temporary defeat. Uh, and, will, uh, and will attempt to manipulate the situation to get what he wants. So every single time that he thinks he's, uh, that Marshall's got a plan, he's like, okay, sir, I've got it. I understand what you want to do. I've got to, uh, I'm going to start putting uh, uh, forces in play to do this. All of a sudden, FDR comes out of a meeting with our Churchill and says, you know, I just had a meeting with uh, Churchill, and I think we really need to do this. Yes, sir. I'll try and do the best I can. But he let his field commanders do their job. And that sounds pretty simple, right? Hey, Eisenhower, go do your, go do your job. Enter the continent and, uh, and take Berlin. That's too easy. But by the same token, he has to fend off the British political efforts. He has to fend off senators who are wondering, why, why are my constituents dying in large numbers? Hey, I got a note from a, one of my soldiers in the hospital. 
These are all letters. Uh, I brought this one in just for fun. This is one of five volumes of his correspondence just from World War II. And this is a period of June 43 to December 44, so 18 months. And this is the edited version. So not all of it. So that's what Marshall is doing. Is he gloriously leading troops? No. Is he getting in a tank and saying, follow me? No. Does he even get the fun of planning an invasion? He doesn't even get to that. When there's talk about making him the commander for Overlord, he says, that would be nice, but FDR says, I couldn't sleep at night knowing you weren't uh, in D.C. That's great, you know, when the boss likes you that much, but it also means that the boss likes you that much. So he's going to keep, uh, so he's going to keep uh, keeping all these uh, plates spinning. If you guys are all familiar with the plate spinning analogy, he's got to keep this plate spinning and then keep mo mo moving around. He does this for the entire war, and by the end of the war, he is exhausted. So World War II ends, and he says, "Oh, thank goodness, I can retire." Nope, Truman needs him to go to China. Why? Because Truman trusts him. The problem, of course, being is that the China mission is one of those cursed missions uh, uh, to begin with, which is that Truman's not going to give him any resources to do anything with China, but he's got to figure out how can we keep the nationalist Chinese in the fight against the communists. And he goes there and he says there and he goes, boss, this isn't going to work. And Truman's like, yeah, that's nice. Do the best you can. And so he does the best he can, but he comes back, and of course, as we all know, China falls a little bit later. He's then next asked to be the Secretary of State in 1947. So imagine this gentleman who's just spent five years wrangling every fractious personality known to mankind is now being asked to be the Secretary of State in the immediate post-World War II era. Europe is a shambles. The entire, almost the entire continent is filled with displaced persons. The infrastructure is destroyed. Everything is wrecked. We are uh, in the uh, opening stages of the Cold War. And Truman hands this to, uh, to Marshall and says, hey, um, I need you to run our diplomatic affairs. Marshall's like, thanks. Appreciate that. And he does a good job. He doesn't always, uh, and he gives his honest advice. When Truman uh, is looking to recognize Israel, in 1948, Marshall sits there and goes, boss, I understand what you're trying to do, but I think you're doing this for domestic political reasons and you're not considering all the second and third order effects. Truman says, thank you very much for your uh, input. I'm still going to do it. Marshall goes, okay, I got it. The Berlin crisis in 1948, uh, this is where you do the Berlin airlift. At this point, we have to do all, we have to uh, airlift food in for the, to Berlin because the Soviets have cut off the land route. We do, such a, we do such a good job that even when the Soviets pull a, open the lander out, we keep, going, we keep fly, it flying for another couple months just to kind of spike the football in the Soviets. Uh, then at that stage, we're also doing the Marshall Plan. Now, Marshall will tell you that it's not really his plan, it's his staff's plan, which I think is the mark of a good chief of staff when he actually sits there and goes, yeah, it's a good job, but it's really my staff doing all the work. And the Marshall Plan helps rebuild Europe. He helps uh, usher in NATO. And at this point, he's like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. And in 1949, his health is failing. If you can imagine, uh, now almost uh, 10 years of wrangling uh, personalities without any pers direct personal power. This is all side power. And then Truman calls him in to be the Secretary of Defense because... Uh, Truman is uh, suffering from a lot of uh, blowback due to Korea and the fact that the previous Secretary of Defense had kind of embarrassed him for Korea. Now, whether you can argue that that Secretary of Defense was being a scapegoat or not is entirely irrelevant. Truman needed somebody that the public could trust. So in comes Marshall. And he steps right into the great Mar uh, Truman-MacArthur debate. And of course, uh, MacArthur believes that any recommendations from the, uh, from the president are mostly gentle suggestions. 
And, uh, and then and Marshall, and then uh, Truman is getting very, very fed up and frustrated with him. At this point, Marshall urges both sides to use caution. He says, boss, Mar MacArthur is the senior uniformed person on the planet. True story. He'd been a general officer since 1917. Uh, by the same token, he's telling MacArthur, hey, Doug, probably want to watch yourself. You're getting really close. You were stepping, you're, you're stepping up to the line. Well, MacArthur doesn't listen, so Truman finishes him off. Now, interestingly enough, Marshall had told Truman to be careful. But once the decision was made, Marshall backed it to the hilt. Again, that's what you do as a staff officer. You give your opinion, and then so long as what the boss is doing is legal or ethical, you do it, and you support it. And then finally, uh, in 1951, uh, Senator McCarthy uh, attacks him. There, this is a, a long-standing feud between Senator McCarthy and Marshall. Uh, Marshall was seen as a very public member of the Truman administration and before him the FDR administration. So McCarthy blames him for a lot of the decisions made at Yalta uh, that gave away, as McCarthy puts it, most of Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, so uh, Marshall had also supported the firing of MacArthur, which MacArthur did not support. So at this point in the game, uh, Marshall sits here and tells, uh, tells Truman, boss, I'm done. I'm done. Please let me go. And, they, and, um, and Truman lets him go. <laughs> All right, so let's wrap this up because it won't cover his post-Korean War life. And that top one, I think, is the most important. Well, we, th we look at military leadership and we think, wow, leading, grabbing a rifle, leading from the front, taking that hill. When you're 20, that sounds really exciting. But I'll tell you, it's being able to put all the resources in place so that lieutenant can do that is really where wars are won. Honesty and courage. This worked out for, uh, for Marshall. I will tell you, there are, there are a million more stories where it doesn't work out. However, what I will tell you is honesty, courage, conviction are the only way to go about it. Because at the end of the day, if you cannot look yourself in the mirror, then what's the point? And Marshall leads that, uh, does, that at the, does that every day. And finally, this is the last point. This is something that I've been kind of playing with for a while which is we often talk about, wow, aren't we fortunate that uh, these great people just happen to come along at just the right moment in time? Aren't we fortunate that there was a George C. Marshall at night on 1 September 1939 ready to be the chief of staff? Aren't we fortunate there was a George Patton or a William Simpson or a uh, Omar Bradley? And what I'll tell you is the people don't make the moment, the moment make the people. Those people are out there. They're always out there. There are people that are doing these things every day. They just don't have the opportunity to shine because they don't, thankfully, we don't have a World War II on the, uh, uh, bearing down on us. So that's what I'll, that's what, that's what I'll point out to you is, is that we don't get the luxury of picking our team right before a big fight. We have the team we have, so let's make sure it's a good one. And that's, what, and that's what Marshall did. So I think we've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, but that's all I've got. So that's, for uh, that's our advertisement for next month. But I'll leave this up. Uh, let's go back there and then work our way forward. Uh, I enjoyed your uh, presentation very much. Uh, I recall that uh, Eisenhower served with uh, MacArthur in the Philippines. Uh, uh, before the uh, before, uh, in years before uh, MacArthur was fired, uh, my question is whether uh, Marshall had had any um, experience serving with or close to or under um, uh, MacArthur prior to the 1950s. I'd have to go back and look at the exact specifics. Uh, it's one of those that I don't think they ever served in the same organization. They served tangentially to each other quite a bit. Uh, Marshall spent a significant amount of time in the Philippines. Uh, he, he actually had two tours of duty in the Philippines. Uh, so did Marshall. But uh, then, uh, but beyond that, I, I never saw a chance where either one worked for the other. Uh, but it was one of those cases of they knew each other. They're about the same year group. 
Uh, I think uh, MacArthur was a little bit senior. But beyond that, it's, it's a case of, it's a small army. So even though they didn't necessarily work in the same regiment or battalion, they certainly knew each other and, uh, and interacted. Sometimes friendly, sometimes not so. Yeah, I was just curious, what rank was Marshall when FDR picked him to be chief of staff? I believe he was a one-star general at the time. So, he, so uh, at that point, he jumped any number of other senior officers to become chief of staff. Kind of upset some folks. <laughs> but uh, Marshall was one of those guys where he's like, hey, guys, I didn't make the decision. Boss made the decision. You, wanna ha you have beef with it? Go talk to him. I can't do anything about it. And then uh, Roosevelt, uh, love him or hate him, knew who he wanted to work with and went with it. And I think a lot of it comes down to Marshall was willing to tell him no. Interestingly enough, the two weren't necessarily personally close. Uh, Marshall said that the only, even though uh, he was invited repeatedly out to Hyde Park, the, the, uh, I think the, he said the, the only time he was actually there was for uh, um, FDR's funeral. I don't know how true or not that is, but that's what I uh, picked up. Did uh, Marshall ever get involved in uh, uh, such, I guess you would call it minutia, that it was proved very early in the war that the M4 Sherman tank was a piece of junk uh, compared to what the Germans had? and. Would Marshall ever get involved and say, listen, we've got to have better equipment? Um, the answer, the short answer is yes, he did to a degree. A lot of what it comes out to is figuring out what will work for us. The M4 Sherman was a beautiful tank in 1942 and even 1943. It could defeat any German armor on the battlefield with the exception of the, uh, of, of the Tiger, of which there were very limited numbers. The Sherman also had the advantage of we were already, it was already in mass production. And what we ended up with is, is that when we saw the Tiger come out, and then we saw the Panther come out, and the, even the longer barreled Panzer IVs, we thought we had an answer in the high velocity 76. Turned out to not be the best solution, so now he's stuck in a very awkward situation, because bear in mind, we're not just equipping and supplying our own formations. We are also supplying the armed forces of any number of allies. Uh, the Chinese, the British, the, the, um, the French. Uh, all of these are using American equipment. And if we were to fundamentally shift off of the Sherman onto a different platform, first what we're going to do is we're going to lose manufacturing uh, time because, again, we're pumping out Shermans in ma en masse. And two is we now have to lose more time because we're having to train these guys on a new piece of kit. So what he did, so a lot of what it was is that he was, he was faced with that very difficult situation of, yeah, we know the Sherman's not a great tank against the more modern German armor. However, quite frankly, we're not losing a lot of tanks to the German armor. We lose, much more, we lose many more tanks to, say, the, the PAC-76s and all those kind of stuff. But really what it comes out to is how many casualties are you willing to take because you waited too long and how many casualties are you willing to take because your equipment is, a, is average? And that's really the hard decision that he, had, that he played a part in making. Now, he is going to be uh, play a part in getting the M26 pushed through, incidentally, uh, and that's called the Pershing. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if there's a connection there, but uh, I... It was like, you know, maybe, they, maybe there is. But, uh, and we did see those in late 45. But really it comes, it comes into a case of once you get all of these mass of moving parts going, to make a major steering shift is a huge, I mean, uh, you're throwing massive amounts of, of sand into the works there. Now, of course, the negative side is, is that a lot of our armor crews had bad experiences. But that, the, that, those are the, that's, that's why Marshall made those decisions, is that he, that's what he was faced with. Mobilization and finding the best tank, or you know, how long do we want to delay until we can get our armor forces out and trained? 
not a good choice, particularly because in 1942, when we bought the Sherman, it was a great tank. 43, it was an okay tank. 44, it was a Midland tank. Uh, and 45, okay enough for what it was asked to do. Good. Anything else? Yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, okay, Marshall becomes a chief of staff September 1st, 1939. It's almost two years until the United States actually gets into the war. And so in 39, you have a European war starting. At that time, you also had the Asian War of Japan and China. They're not linked until Pearl Harbor. Um, so you've got almost two years with Marshall as chief of staff, and we're going through all this mobilization. Now, who is pushing for the, to build up uh, this military in, the, in 1939, 1940, 1941. Is it Marshall saying this is what we need or is it true, uh, or Roosevelt saying this is what we need? A little from column A, a little from column B. Uh, what it comes out to is, is that Marshall is looking at the international situation and realizing that it's only a matter of time. He doesn't know how, but he, know it's, he knows it's coming. However, that said, it's also the, it's, he can provide recommendations and, uh, and insight. It's FDR and FDR pushing through Congress the, uh, the protect mobilization plans, the peacetime draft. So this is Marshall going and telling FDR, sir, this is what I think is coming. But it's FDR and, uh, the, and the Congress that are actually appropriating the funds, that are uh, drafting the laws to make all of these things happen. So in a, short answer is yes, they, they, they both were. I, how much FDR was influenced by Marshall's opinion? I don't know. I think FDR was very sympathetic towards what was going on, particularly in Europe already. The question is, as to would he have made that move without Marshall there? I don't know. I would like to think he would have. Uh, how did Marshall get along with uh, the somewhat mercurial and brilliant Admiral King? Um, could Admiral King have used his talents better in the Pacific? as in putting Admiral King in the Pacific? Well, yeah, the good news is Admiral King had Admiral, had Admiral Nimitz. And it's one of the, and uh, that, that sounds a little glib, but that, that's actually the honest truth, is, is that Admiral King didn't need, Admiral King was the chief of naval operations. Uh, so basically, Marshall's counterpart in the, uh, naval, in the Department of the Navy. Bearing in mind that the War Department, which is basically the Army and the embryonic Air Force, were in one uh, in uh, the War Department, and the Department of the Navy was a different department. They, the only place where they actually met was at the president. So I don't know how well they, I don't think they necessarily invited each other to tea parties, but I think that they, uh, they worked well, uh, they worked, they found a way to work with each other. And this is, I think, one of the forgotten stories about World War II is we often talk about all the personality conflicts, and oh, oh my goodness, there's, there's a lot of them, right? But yet, at the end of the day, you have, people, you have uh, leaders who are willing to be generally, please hear me stress the word generally, uh, be the adult in the room. And not always. But the idea being is, is that you could have an opposing a position, an opposing point of view, sit down with someone in a room, argue with each other, and then at the end of the day, shake hands, whether you mean it or not, is perhaps beside the point, and abide by the decision that's met, at least for the moment. Now, are people always doing the political games to see who's going to get what? Absolutely. There is a reason why MacArthur has his own theater carved out of the Southwest Pacific. It's because he couldn't play nice with others. So we just kind of left him out there uh, to do that. But overall, for the most part, I would have to say that Marshall and King while not the best of friends all the time, could work together. And I think we're done on questions. So thank you very much for your time.